Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 83 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of November 22nd to 28th, 2012. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm gonna be your ranter and raconteur, talking about things important to me, I think deserve your attention. As always, any comments, questions, reactions, tips and tidbits, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here somewhere a couple of times during the show, and you can get the email address at the website. Uh, as always, I ask that uh, if and when you send me email, that you please include something like, you know, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so that I know it's not spam. Okay, with that introduction out of the way, um, I got so much stuff to get to today that I'm not going to get to it all. But the second half of the show is going to be something a little bit, a little bit special, a little bit different. But I'm going to start. Uh, last week, I said I wanted to talk this week about this grand bargain business, this grand bargain that's to be gotten in the lame duck session of Congress um, in order to avoid falling off the fiscal cliff. Now, I wanted to spend a fair amount of time on that this week, but because of other things, I'm just not going to be able to. So it's going to be reduced to a few comments, but there will be more next week. I promise that. But here's the really important thing I want you to know for right now. This grand bargain to avoid the fiscal cliff. It ain't grand, it ain't no bargain, and there ain't no cliff. Uh, if no deal is reached, this is what happens. Uh, at, the, at the end of 2012, the so-called Bush tax cuts expire. In January, automatic across-the-board budget cuts of $110 billion, half of which comes from the Pentagon, will go into effect. Now, there are, those, there are other issues, but those are the ones that the people are the most concerned about. The thing is, it's not like come January 2nd, snap, there's uh, tax increases and budget cuts. Rather, that's when they start to be phased in. The talk about a fiscal cliff, it's a scare tactic. That's all it is. It's designed to stampede Congress and the public into accepting trillions of dollars of cuts in social programs for the poor and for the needy. It's to stampede us into accepting cuts in the so-called big three, uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, cuts that, in fact, would be, over time, would be deeper than those would occur with the so-called fiscal cliff and doing this in exchange for some paltry increase in the rate that, uh, the tax rate that rich people pay, rich people who've seen their tax rates go down and down again and their wealth go up and up again over the past few decades. Making this so-called grand bargain, which, you know, by the way, Obama wants to do this. He does. Last year, he offered the Republicans $4 trillion in budget cuts in an attempt to get them to come to a deal, which enthrall to their paymasters. They foolishly didn't do. But this is a deal, making this grand bargain. What this amounts to is the poor uh, tossing in their pound of flesh while the rich toss in their pocket lint and everybody's saying, oh, that's balanced because everybody gave up something. A bad deal here is worse than no deal. We should say loud and clear, protect the poor, protect the needy, protect the middle class, protect the big three, and make the rich pay their fair share or no deal. I'll have more on this next week, I promise. All right, from there, we're going on to our weekly feature, the Clown Award. This is for given for meritorious stupidity and insensitivity. In 2006, the city of Sarasota, Florida, was named as the meanest city in the nation by the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and the National Coalition for the Homeless. It has since lost that honor to Los Angeles, in fact, but it appears as though it may be trying to win it back. On November 11th, Sarasota police arrested a 28-year-old homeless man named Darren Kersey because he was charging his cell phone at a charging station in a public picnic shelter. He was charged with theft of city utilities. Now, there's no sign anywhere saying that this is illegal, no indication that it will be against the law, uh, and that's likely part of the reason that the case was thrown out as soon as it got to court. 
Uh, but this was after Kersey spent a night in jail because he didn't have the $500 for the bail money. Now, the thing to note here, the thing that's important, is that the judge threw the case out. The city was fully prepared to prosecute Kersey on a charge of theft of city utilities for the heinous crime of plugging his cell phone charger into an outlet at a public picnic shelter. This at a time when people in Sarasota who are rich enough to afford electric cars can get them recharged for free at a variety of charging stations around the city, including one at City Hall. Now, the local chapter of the ACLU in Sarasota has been monitoring the attempts by the police to force the homeless out of parks. A representative of that group says, and I'm quoting, so much happens on a daily basis, it's hard to keep up with it. Every day there's something new. I'll tell you what's not new here is the poor getting punished for wanting a small part of what the rich get for free. And to show the true clownishness of all of this, according to a recent survey of cities across the country, on average, it costs cities on a per day basis three times as much to jail somebody as it does to provide them shelter space. So, the city of Sarasota, Florida, and all you other places around the country that don't want to deal with homelessness but just want to make it invisible, places like Philadelphia, which uh, last spring made it a crime to feed people in a public place, or like uh, Clearwater, Florida, which over this past summer passed a law making it a crime to sit on a public sidewalk with a fine of $500. All of your cities more concerned with your image than with the welfare of your residents. All of you, you are ignorant, short-sighted, suck up the rich, screw the poor clowns. All right, moving on from there. Uh, this is something that could be uh, filed under the category unintentional humor. Unintentional humor is when something strikes you funny um, even though you know it wasn't actually intended to be. By tradition uh, and by fact, uh, over the past several years, Black Friday, so-called, has been the uh, busiest shopping day of the year. Now, uh, I always thought Black Friday was a, funny, was a funny name for it, but apparently this arose out of Philadelphia around 1960. The police there started calling the day after Thanksgiving Black Friday because of all the headaches it gave them with the increased traffic. Well, this Black Friday may prove to be, or may have proven to be by the time you see this, uh, a black one for Walmart. Walmart, the nation's largest private, uh, private employer with over a million employees nationwide, the nation's largest retail chain, is having some problems of late. It's seen increasing challenges from labor organizations such as our Walmart, which are responding to the concerns and frustrations of overpaid, underworked, exploited workers. Actions including uh, walkouts and uh, rallies at over a thousand Walmarts around the country are planned for the day after Thanksgiving. Now, Walmart pays notoriously low wages with little chance for improvement. Workers often start at little more than the minimum wage. Now, they can get a yearly increase based on a performance review, but the maximum possible increase is 60 cents an hour. Somebody could start at Walmart as an $8 an hour cart pusher and six years later still be making only like $10.60. And even those figures are misleading because Walmart makes a practice of keeping its hourly workers at below full-time hours, keeps them as part-timers, so basically so it can skimp on the benefits it pays them. And on top of all of that, there is a wage cap on hourly workers, a wage cap of something under $20 an hour. That is the most you can ever earn at Walmart, as a non-manager at Walmart, no matter how long you work there, no matter how many positive evaluations you get. And it's not like the company can't afford to do more. In the third quarter of 2012, its profits are up 9% over the preceding year. It was raking in profits. Now, remember, not sales. We're talking about profits. It was raking in, in profits at an annualized rate of over $14 billion a year. Meanwhile, it's also been revealed that Walmart may have used illegal bribery 
to uh, expand its operations in at least four countries, Mexico, Brazil, China, and India. Okay, now what's the unintentional humor in all this? Walmart has filed an unfair labor practice complaint against the United Food and Concession Workers. Walmart is alleging that the UFCW is responsible for the labor actions, labor actions which, and this is quoting their statement, have created an uncomfortable environment and undue stress on Walmart's customers, including families with children. Nowhere in this complaint does it dispute a single assertion the workers have made. So Walmart, the company that bribes officials in other countries while allowing its U.S. workers such lousy pay and benefits that a significant number of them are on food stamps, while the company makes $14 billion a year, Walmart is claiming that it is the victim. And it doesn't get any funnier than that. All right, uh, from there on to our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Now, I have something that I call the clock of history. This is the timeline of events, of any particular set of events in history. And the thing is, in every conflict, in every conflict, every side wants the clock of history to start at a certain point, start with a certain event. The idea is that everything before that time, everything before that event is irrelevant. It doesn't count. Ignore it. Pay no attention to it. Every side, of course, wants to choose where the clock of history starts running at a point most advantageous to their argument. Now, this is true in all conflicts, particularly in the Middle East, particularly in the conflict between the uh, Israelis and the Palestinians. For the past week plus, the, the bombs and rockets have been doing their evil work um, in Gaza and in southern Israel, and there was talk, always talk, of a ceasefire. Now, as I say this, this is on Wednesday, as I say this, there is supposed to be a ceasefire in place. We'll find out how well that works, but there's supposed to be a ceasefire in place. But despite that, that there is a ceasefire, uh, there's something that needs to be said now. Many times it can be difficult to know when to start the clock of history. That's especially true in the tangled history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Sometimes, however, it's not. From late October into mid-November, there was an exchange of fire between the Israeli military and uh, militants in Gaza, exchange of fire across the border. But Egypt brokered a ceasefire where Hamas and the Israeli military each promised that they would not fire unless fired upon first. That was on November 13th. The next day, an Israeli rocket was used to assassinate Ahmed al-Jabari. He's the military leader of Hamas. Something which, by the way, our media, for some reason, keeps forgetting to mention, Hamas is the elected government of Gaza. But an Israeli rocket was used to assassinate Ahmed al-Jabari. The fact is, there was a ceasefire, and Israel broke it. There simply is no question about this. That's when the clock of history started for this latest cycle of bloodshed. That's when the death and destruction started. And so the death and destruction we have seen in this past week, and that we may well still see, this is Israel's fault. This is simply not arguable. Now, there's so much more that needs to be said about it. Really, 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 really so much more, including things about our own government, shameful displays of fawning fealty to Israeli militarism. And I do intend to talk more about this next week. But for now, I want to leave you with this one thought. Sometimes it really is hard to tell just who is actually to blame for an outbreak of a cycle of violence. This is not one of those times. And we are taking a break. And we're back. Now, for the rest of the show, I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I like to do this every year. So, kitties, gather around the campfire. Uncle Larry is going to tell you the true story of the first Thanksgiving. 
Now, there have been a number of places which have claimed to have had the first Thanksgiving, but when we say the phrase, we're thinking of an event that took place in Plymouth in the fall of 1621. So yes, that's what I'm talking about. Now, the first thing to know, just a little bit of quick background of this. Uh, do you remember being taught in school how during that first winter, uh, none of the, the settlers that came in the Mayflower, that none of them would have survived if it had not been for the help of the friendly natives. You remember being taught that? It's not true. They didn't speak to a native till March. Now, the local natives, they were friendly and they were helpful, just not in the first winter after that. But with that little bit of background, we're going to jump ahead to the fall of 1621. Now, I'm going to begin the story by citing a book with the rather ponderous title of A Relation or Journal of the Beginning and Proceedings of the English Plantations Settled at Plymouth in New England by Certain English Adventurers, Both Merchants and Others. It's popularly known today as, by the less cumbersome name, Mort's Relation. Now in that volume, it was published in England in 1622, there is a letter from Edward Winslow to a loving and old friend um, in England and Winslow, he was a Mayflower passenger. He was one of the original settlers. And he wrote this letter from uh, Plymouth, dated December 11, 1621. I'm quoting from that letter. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help besides, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest their greatest king, Massasoit, with some ninety men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, yet by the goodness of God we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty." Okay, got that? Here's the thing you need to know. That is the only contemporaneous account of the first Thanksgiving that is known to exist. In fact, the only other even near contemporaneous account, at least so far as I know, uh, was, was written by William Bradford, who was another first comer, a Mayflower passenger. He was writing in the early 1630s, which means 10 or 12 years after the event. And he said, and I'm quoting him now, they began now to gather in the small harvest they had and to fit up their houses and dwellings against winter, being all well recovered in health and strength and had all things in good plenty. For as some were thus employed in affairs in abroad, others were exercised in fishing about cod and bass and other fish, of which they took good store, of which every family had their portion. All the summer there was no want, and now began to come in store of fowl as winter approached, of which this place did abound when they came first, but afterwards decreased by degrees. And besides waterfowl, there was great store of wild turkeys, of which they took many, besides venison, etc. Besides, they had about a peck of meal a week to a person, or now since harvest, Indian corn to that proportion, which made many afterwards write so largely of their plenty here to their friends in England, which are not feigned, but true reports. Now, based on other references in these two sources, we can also say that this 1621 feast took place after September 18th and before November 9th. Most likely it was late September or early October because that would have been shortly after harvest. Okay, that's it. That's everything we actually know. Everything else is based on assumptions, interpretations, and guesswork. Some of it informed guesswork, some of it not. The first thing to realize is that this was not a thanksgiving, okay, as people at the time would have understood the term. And the period of thanksgiving was a religious occasion, uh, set aside, a day set aside to thank God for some special and unexpected blessing. It would be done as the occasion for it arose, and to plan for one every year would have been thought a great presumption on God's intentions. It was, what we had here instead was a very traditional, very secular, very English, harvest feast. It was a tradition that if you had a good harvest, you would have a feast. And as part of that feast, you would invite everybody who had been helpful to you over the course of that year. And the natives had been helpful to the town, so the natives were invited. Now, it's true the settlers didn't have a good harvest. Bradford calls it small. But the fact is, they had a harvest. 
At that point, they could feel, yeah, we're going to make it. They could feel pretty confident that they were going to survive and this, this undertaking was going to survive, which is reason enough for a celebration. Now, as for the eternal question of what they ate, well, we don't know for certain because nothing is specified, but we can, we can make some good guesses. Uh, they almost undoubtedly had fish, specifically cod and bass. Waterfowl, such as duck and goose, it very, seems very likely, and probably, yes, they probably did have turkey. Uh, Bradford says, remember, they took many. Uh, they may have had deer. Bradford mentions venison. Uh, now, in the period, venison meant hunted meat, but that obviously does include deer. They may have well had deer. Uh, we don't know about the deer the natives brought, by the way. We don't know if that was brought soon enough to be butchered and prepared as part of the feast, or did they bring it later as sort of like presents to the leaders and a thank you for having been, you know, entertained and feasted for three days. Another possibility is lobster or other shellfish. Elsewhere in that same letter that I quoted, Edward Winslow says they were plentiful in the area. So were eels, which were popular among English people at the time. Winslow said they could take a hogshead in a night. A hogshead is a kind of cask that holds 63 gallons of liquid. And yeah, that's a lot. It may have been an exaggeration. Winslow was kind of like that. Now, more tentatively, they could have had a pie made of squash from the garden, sweetened with uh, dried fruits, which would have had to have been imported from England. Also, salads made from other stuff in the gardens is a good possibility, too. To drink, it was most likely mostly water. Winslow says their barley grew indifferent good, that is, like it was a so-so crop, and there's no mention of hops. No hops, no beer, not much barley, not much ale. They might have had some wine which had been brought over with them from England and saved for a special occasion, but most likely it was mostly water. So, you know, that's pretty much it, kiddies. Not much to build a uh, whole mythology on, is it? But now, for the reason I actually bring this up. I bring this up every year. I like to tell this story every year, right around Thanksgiving. Uh, and this is why. Every year, around this time, without fail, I come across some revisionist history of the event. Years ago in grammar school, I, along with everybody else, was taught tales that roused images of noble settlers and savage natives. Now there are some who simply want to flip those adjectives to a tale of savage settlers and noble natives. We are regaled with tales of bloodthirsty uh, settlers and how Massasoit have actually had it argued that Massasoit brought 90 men with him to the feast because he was afraid without a massive show of force he might be kidnapped or killed. All of that is bunk, pure and simple bunk. In fact, relations between Plymouth and neighboring natives was actually quite good at the time and, were, and it continued to be reasonably good for some decades. There were stresses and strains, yes, of course, but um, for the most part, they managed to keep together the peace treaty that was made in the spring of 1621. Now, things gradually got worse over the years. I won't get to all the reasons why, because it's not important here. Uh, I will say, though, that one of the big causes was vast cultural differences over land. The natives did not have a concept of land ownership. The idea of owning land did not exist in their culture. But, of course, owning land is an everyday concept to any European. So what kept happening was things like, for example, uh, some settler would, they thought, buy land from a native and then get very angry because the native didn't leave. Well, the, um, the thing is, the native thought they were selling the rights to share the resources of the land and these new people were compensating them for the fact there's less to go around. What the settler thought they bought and what the native thought they sold were not the same thing. This kind of thing caused no end of conflict. Finally, irrevocably, that peace broke down. But that wasn't until 1675, more than 50 years after the first Thanksgiving. At that time, in the fall of 1621, native settler relations were actually rather good. In fact, the very next sentences, that Winslow letter I quoted about the first Thanksgiving, the very next sentences of that same letter are these. We have found the Indians very faithful in their covenant of peace with us, very loving and ready to pleasure us. We often go to them and they come to us. Some of us have been 50 miles by land in the country with them. Winslow also says that the other native leaders have made peace with Plymouth on the same terms as they made with Massasoit, as the result of which there's peace among the natives in a way that Winslow said had not been formally. 
Winslow also says the same letter. We, for our parts, walk as peaceably and safely in the wood as in the highways of England. We entertain them familiarly in our houses, and they as friendly bestowing their venison on us. They are a people without any religion or knowledge of God, yet very trusty, which means reliable, quick of apprehension, quick to understand, ripe-witted, just. Now that doesn't sound either like bloodthirsty settlers either eager to kill natives or like natives who are afraid for any contact with those settlers. Now, if you're still not convinced, consider this. In June of 1621, like three or four months before this event, the town felt it necessary to send a message to Massasoit asking him to restrain his people from coming in such numbers to the town. This is from Mort's relation. This is another quote. This is what they told Massasoit. But whereas his people came very often and very many together unto us, bringing for the most part their wives and children with them, they were welcome. Yet we being but strangers as yet at Patuxet, alias New Plymouth, and not knowing how our corn might prosper, we could no longer give them such entertainment as we had done and as we still desired to do. In other words, they had to ask not so many natives to come because they couldn't be good hosts. Simply flipping who was an angel and who was a demon is trash. Neither of these people was either. Neither was a saint, neither was a devil. So I reject the revisionist history. In fact, I resent the revisionist history. I resent it first off because it's lousy history. It looks to, uh, to ideology instead of information. It looks to satisfy the demands of politics, not of scholarship. It is every bit as full of false tales and mythology as the pap that we were fed as school children. The first Thanksgiving was a moment of celebration when everyone on both sides here thought this was going to work out. Now, that was a foolish hope. It really was. It was a foolish hope. There really was no chance of that. But the po point is, at the time, it existed. And consider what Europeans of various sorts have done to the natives of North America over the ensuing decades, there really is no reason to exaggerate. So I quite frankly resent the attempts to strip away that one moment of hope in, in pursuit of a modern political agenda. So. I hope you enjoyed your turkey day. I hope you got to spend some time with family and friends, hopefully both. And I hope you can understand why I celebrate the day not so much as an expression of thankfulness for the past or even the present, but more as an expression of hope for the future. That hope, too, may prove to be as foolish as that of 1621. But the fact is, the one bottom line, indispensable requirement for making a better future is hope and I won't give it up. So that's it for me. We're going to wrap up there. Um, I will just see you next week. I hope you had a great time, a great turkey day, and um, we'll see you next week. Bye.